y'all hear me okay? Is the sound okay? Yeah. I'm Mary B. McMillan. I'm with the North Carolina AFL-CIO. And on behalf of all the organizations sponsoring this event, thank you for coming. It is great to see this room full of folks for this event. This event is part of a multi-stop, out-of-control and Raleigh tour that is sponsored by a long list of progressive organizations that I'm not going to read but are listed on the yellow flyer that you received. Tonight, we're going to shine a light on this new legislature's extremist agenda. You'll hear about legislative attacks on workers, education, the environment, and voting rights. And no matter what the issue, this agenda can best be summed up using a phrase from Speaker Tom Tillis, and that is, divide and conquer. It is an agenda that promotes the interest of a few while seeking to divide the many. You will understand why this legislature serves the interest of the few when you hear how Art Pope and his corporate cash helped usher these extremists into office. And finally, we're going to give some ideas and share with you how we think we can rein in this out-of-control legislature and further the fight for social justice in the state. So we have several speakers who will each speak for a few minutes, but we're going to have some time for questions at the end so that we can hear from you and we can learn from each other. We're going to be out of here by 8.30. Folks have already been talking to me about the 9 o'clock basketball game, so don't worry. We'll get you out in time. So thank you again for being here. And I, I just want to, I noticed that we had some elected officials come in, uh, legislators Patsy Kiever and Ray Rapp, certainly pleased to have you here. And I want to be clear, they're the good guys. We're not talking about, about them tonight. So our first speaker tonight is Rob Schofield, who is Director of Research and Policy Development for NC Policy Watch which is a project of the North Carolina Justice Center. And Rob's going to set the stage for the dis discussion and give an overview of the legislature so far. So please welcome Rob. I know it's great to be back. Um, I was just here about six weeks ago with my colleague Chris Fitzsimon. Many of you know Chris from television and radio. And we had a great forum uh, in Asheville, so I'm not going to repeat everything. Those are some, I see familiar faces, some folks were at that meeting. Uh, and I think we'll get out of here, like Mary B. said, real quick. Although I was talking to my friend Leslie Boyd, I said, we'll be out of here in an hour. And she said, no, this is Asheville. You don't understand. <laughs> we, won't, we won't go quite that quick, but in any event, I'm, de I'm delighted to be here. I'm going to, in a, less than 10 minutes, tell you the terrible story of the 2011 General Assembly that has bled right into 2012. My organization is NC Policy Watch. You go to ncpolicywatch.com. You can get daily commentary, news updates on everything that's going on in Raleigh. You can participate in our blog, speak up. There's some pens and pads over there with our website on it. Grab one. We'd love to have welcome your participation. Subscribe to our newsletters for free. Um, a couple of nights ago, I was talking to a friend, uh, well, actually an acquaintance, who was a so self-described social justice minister at a major church in Raleigh. And I was sort of telling her what I did and what I was going to do this week. And she said, yeah, what's been going on with the legislature? I really haven't been paying attention. I mean, this is a social justice minister in Raleigh. I was thinking, wow, we've got some educating to do. I know this is probably a better informed audience, but I, I thought it would be helpful maybe to cover five main things, five main topics, maybe takeaways for you tonight to remember about what's been going on with the General Assembly in Raleigh. The first one is that the General Assembly, the folks that are running it anyway, is, is clearly the most reactionary that we've had in decades in this state. Now, I'm not talking about, uh, and when you say decades, that, that has some implications. I'm not talking about George Wallace, Lester Maddox, racist, that kind of awful things that went on a few decades ago in, in our part of the country. But in many respects, they are actually more conservative than those folks, in many respects. We're talking about people who are truly very, very extreme. They are people who do not believe 
in the concept of public solutions, public systems, public structures to confront the, the, the challenges that we have as a society. The, the, these public systems and structures that literally hold the fabric of our society together, that make it possible to have a middle class life for most people, they don't believe in that. They believe in a sort of very uh, archaic dog-eat-dog -dog, uh, social Darwinian world in which every person is for themselves, in which public st systems and structures are minimized to the greatest extent possible. Um, this past week, the Speaker of the House, uh, Tom Tillis, who has, is developing quite a reputation for putting his foot in his mouth, um, was giving a speech in Ashborough, and our good friends at Progress NC were there, thank goodness, to, to videotape it. And Tillis was talking about his colleague, the number two man in the House of Representatives, Representative Paul Stam. Now, mind you, this is the House Majority Leader, and this is a quote from his, from his uh, video, a very brief quote. I understand the Majority Leader Stam has said that his goal would be to ultimately eliminate public schools. And I categorically disagree with that for a variety of reasons. Right now, with him being majority leader and me being speaker, I like my chances. Now, think about that for a minute. I guess he was trying to brag that he actually believes in the public schools, but he's publicly admitting, without any sense of irony or, or embarrassment, that the number two man in the House, the man who's, one of the, who's driving the agenda in many respects, doesn't even believe in public education in our state. Um, we now, I understand, I've learned, I met with some great folks uh, before the event tonight. There's a, there's a battle apparently brewing in, in Asheville to perhaps even take your water system and turn it into a private system. This is the model that is being held out and it's being, there was a special committee that met in the General Assembly just a couple of weeks ago to talk about selling off public assets, things like uh, museums and aquariums and roads and you name it, things that are public, they don't believe in that. These people are, are extremists, they are being driven by, you're going to learn about the man who's been funding a lot of it here in a moment, but I think that's something for you to take away. A second thing for you to take away is though they may have some very pure, uh, purest beliefs, it's actually an incredibly sort of cynical ends justify the means approach that they've been bringing to governance. Mary B. sort of alluded it to it in her comment, the divide and conquer quote, and some of you who came to our event in December got to see uh, Tillis say these words himself, but I'll read them to you just again. Uh, once again, just so you'll have, a, 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 have them fresh in your mind. This is Speaker Tillis speaking in Madison County last fall. What we have to do is find a way to divide and conquer the people who are on assistance. We have to show respect for that woman who has cerebral palsy and had no choice in her condition and needs help, and we should help. And we need to get those folks to look down at those people who choose to get into a condition that makes them dependent on the government. Wow. I, by dependent on the government, I wonder if he means some of the corporations that he's giving tax breaks to. Um, but, I mean, it's a very cynical approach. It's a very cynical uh, attitude. And uh, you're going to learn more about the midnight session uh, from Brian uh, with NCAE. But, I mean, we saw that play out again last month when the General Assembly came into session allegedly to overturn the veto of the Racial Justice Act, another sort of amazing step to come to Raleigh to do that. And instead, when they couldn't do that, they convened a session at 1 o'clock in the morning to take away the North Carolina Association of Educators' right to collect dues and people's paychecks. So it's a remarkably ends justifying the means, very cynical approach. Third thing I want to take to you to take away is we have passed a dreadful state budget. You've probably heard allusions to this, but consider this one sort of, I think, most salient fact. Um, we call it the back to the Nixon era budget. For, we, we have this sort of mythology that taxes have been going up and up and up in North Carolina forever. It's actually not true. For about the last 40 years, we've been spending roughly 6 to 7 percent, roughly 6.5 percent of total state income on public structures, public investments. To, you add up all the income in the state, of all the people in the state, you think about 6.5 percent, that's what the state spends on public structures and public institutions. The budget that we just passed takes that number down to 5 percent. That may not sound like much, but in, on scale, it's a huge change. It's taking us back 40 years. And mind you, when, that was the, when it was that way in the early 70s, we weren't spending nearly as much as we do on health care today. So think about the implications for education, for the courts, for the environment. Uh, it's really taking us, it, we talk about these folks as wanting to take us back to the 60s. In some respects, I think it's the 1860s, not just the 1960s yeah. that they want to take us back. $2 billion out of the Medicaid system over the next few years. Firing thousands of educators, you hear more about that, wrecking uh, early childhood programs, decimating higher education, decimating the courts, the public defenders, environmental programs. So a dreadful, 
Back to the Nixon era budget. Number four thing to take away. It was also a dreadful substantive session when you just look at the laws they passed, irrespective of the budget. We had a 47-day hostage crisis in which people were denied their unemployment insurance benefits because of a, it was being used as a tactic to negotiate the budget. We have the so-called Women's Right to Know Act, which requires uh, young teenage uh, victims of rape to uh, gaze upon the uh, 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 ultrasound of the developing fetus, and the doctor's even required to note if she chooses to avert her eyes. Uh, we have um, new election restrictions, uh, at attempts to, to imp uh, mandate mandatory photo ID, you'll hear about that, to restrict uh, access to voting. We've got uh, school vouchers proposed, 90% interest rates on small loans, 60% wasn't high enough, uh, eviscerating the Department of Environment and Natural Resources. Uh, as we say, we talked about the attempts to repeal the Racial Justice Act, a move to bring concealed weapons, make it easier for people to bring concealed weapons into public parks because, you know, there was a big demand for people to bring concealed weapons <laughs> to ball games that their kids were playing baseball at. Um, you know, my colleague Chris Simon puts it this way, I think he's right. In 2010, voters were angry. They were angry at the terrible economy, the slow recovery, the lack of jobs, the sense that maybe people weren't paying enough attention, but they didn't vote for this. They voted for change, but they didn't vote for all these crazy, wacky ideas. And so the last thing that I'll leave you with is, is that this General Assembly continues their ways. They are not only cynical about how they're going about it, but they're directly going about subverting the process when it comes to open and transparent government. Even though they got elected on this promise of more transparency, we, uh, we just learned today, actually, of a minor victory. They've been calling these so-called special sessions just about every month. Traditionally, special sessions in North Carolina were for special circumstances, an emergency, a natural disaster, some kind of, and, and there were times when that's been abused. But for the most part, that's what they were for. The, the new folks running the General Assembly just have them every month. We just get the General Assembly back, and we don't know what we're going to deal with. We'll just uh, see when we get there what we got votes to do. So that's why we had this vote on the NCAE checkoff. They were planning on having one next uh, next week. Actually, there still will be one on February 16th, and we hope you'll come to the rally to protest it. We got news today, actually, though, that they may, they've now announced that it's just going to be a so-called skeletal session where they won't take anything up, which would be a victory. We actually got a memo from a corporate lobbyist that somebody got a hold of earlier this week where they had been discussing secretly without telling anybody with the Speaker's office, oh, we might come into session and, and re, uh, revamp the unemployment insurance laws in the state. You know, without telling anybody. No process, and then you come into session for 24 hours, a couple of hours in actual session, and you change the law. It's, it's really uh, subverting the process and, and, um, and, a, and a dramatic change from the way things are run in this state. So the bottom line, I hope you'll listen to the other speakers. I hope you'll pick up the materials on what you can do about this. I think you should take some consolation in this small victory. I think our shining some light on it over the last few days probably inspired them to change next week's special session and not spring this on us, although we're going to remain vigilant. But it's an it's a incredibly important issue. I hope you'll stay engaged, and I look forward to your, answering your questions later on. Thanks very much. Thank you, Rob. Rob kind of gave the overview, the long, depressing list uh, of legislation that these folks um, considered and passed this session. So we're going to look a little in depth at some of these issues. So our next speaker is Robert Dawkins, who's an organizer with Democracy NC, and he's going to talk specifically about the attacks on voting rights. So, Robert? So how are we doing today? Yeah, that's good. I look out, I see a lot of faces. I see some of our board members here. I see a lot of our advocates. I thank you all for coming. For people that are not familiar with Democracy North Carolina, just to tell you a little bit about us, Democracy North Carolina's mission in a nutshell, in a nutshell is one person, one vote. Uh, we're a nonpartisan organization that uses research, organizing, and advocacy to increase voter participation to work to reduce the influence of big money in politics and to achieve a government that is truly of the people, for the people, and by the people. We envision a government where barriers to vote or serve in public office are removed. We want people to have confidence in their political system and feel ownership in their government and we, to, to, for, to, to have ownership in their government and want elected officials to represent and respect the diversity and interest of the people in North Carolina that